All right, everybody. I think we're going to go ahead and get started now. Um, hopefully you all can hear me. We've got um, a lot to do today, and I'm really glad for everyone um, joining us. So welcome to week one of our advanced webinar series, Land Cover Classification from Satellite Imagery. My name is Cindy Schmidt, and I'm going to be your instructor today. For this course, we're going to have two four-hour sessions. So one is this Tuesday, and one will be next Tuesday at the same time from 12 to 4 Eastern Standard Time. This advanced course will work a little differently than other advanced courses that we've offered in the past. So I'm going to lecture for about an hour, probably a little bit less than that. Um, and then I'm going to go through an exercise step by step using QGIS software. So the remainder of the time is to allow you to work on the exercise on your own. So this is kind of like being in a classroom where I will lecture, I'll demonstrate the exercise, and then you can work on the exercise on your own. Um, however, I'll be staying online um, to answer any questions or any problems that you might run into as you're going through the exercise. So I won't be talking the entire time, probably only the first maybe hour, hour and a half or so, um, and then allow you kind of to, to continue on your own. 15 minutes before the end of the session, um, so at about three hours and 45 minutes, I'll give a quick summary and ask if there are, if there are any um, final questions. And we'll kind of gauge how many people are still online by the end. This is kind of a new format for us. So if uh, nobody's left at the end, then we'll, then we'll end it early. Um, but we'll be glad to stay online until um, everybody has their questions answered. So there's going to be a homework exercise at the end of the second week for you to complete if you would like a certificate of completion, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. You can find all the course materials, as usual, at the website listed, at the RSET website listed. This includes the past recordings, um, data links, the in-class exercises, and the homework. Although this format allows for a fairly lengthy Q&A session, you can also email me at the address listed below if you have any additional questions during the week. Lastly, for those of you who have taken our set webin webinars before, you're going to notice that we're using some different software this time. Although this software, which is called GoToMeeting, has some really great features, um, it does not allow you, the participants, to chat with each other. Um, you can only send me and the other organizers questions. Um, we really like that um, feature where you can chat with each other, so we're hoping to find a solution to that in the future. But since this is the first time for us using this new software, um, we're going to go with this format for this one. Okay, I do have a few ground rules because this is um, a really different way for us to be doing things and there are a lot of you, over a hundred of you, and probably more as we go through um, this course. And there's only one of me, so um, it's a lot easier if we kind of stick to these rules. Um, the first thing is that questions can only pertain to the topics presented in the webinars. So if you have other questions um, about remote sensing or about QGIS or something like that, um, I'm, I'm not going to answer those questions just because we simply don't have the time or the resources. Um, if you have not watched the prerequisite Introduction to Remote Sensing webinars, you probably shouldn't watch this webinar because you need to have, this is a fairly advanced webinar, I'm going to be going through things fairly quickly, um, and it and you need to have at least the basics of um, remote sensing before you take this webinar. Um, again, please no general questions about QGIS. We're going to kind of just focus on the plugin that we're using for this particular course. Um, you, if you have 
questions about QGIS and, or the plugin that pertain specifically to that this topic that I'm presenting, then that's fine. And then please no other questions about other remote sensing topics. Simply just we don't have the resources or the time in this particular course. If you have other questions that you'd like to ask me outside of the course, that's fine. Just send me an email and I'll be happy to answer those questions. Okay, this is a topic everyone wants to know about, homework and certificates. Um, we have two homework assignments for this course. One that should already have been completed before this, so it was part of the prerequisite requirements. Um, and then one which will be available after the second session. So not this session, but next week's session will have a homework available for you to fill out. So you will submit both through Google Forms. You will need to complete the course exercises in order to answer the homework questions. To get a certificate of completion, you have to attend both live webinars and complete both homework assignments. You don't have to stay on for the full four hours of the webinars for each session, but at least for the lecture and the exercise demonstration if you can. We realize that there are sometimes some bandwidth issues um, on, on your end, um, and sometimes that is makes it difficult for you to stay on the line. We, we understand that. So we can make some exceptions for those situations. Just let us know. It takes some time to process the certificates, so you can expect to receive them about two months after the completion of the course from Marinus Martins, um, and her email address is li listed here, but no need to email her unless after about four months you haven't received anything yet. There are two main prerequisites, as I mentioned previously, for this course. First, you should know and understand the fundamentals of remote sensing. Again, I can't stress that enough because this is a, a you know a little bit more advanced course, and so it really helps for you to really have those fundamentals already um, under your belt. So you can watch our on-demand course listed above, which includes um, two one-hour recorded webinars um, that you can watch on your own time, or if you've taken a course or something else previously, that's fine too. It's also necessary for you to download and install QGIS. So you have to do that before you start this course. So hopefully all of you have done that already. This is the freely available open source software we'll use throughout the remainder of this course. So it's available for both Macs and PCs, um, and I've used it on both. Um, and in addition to QGIS, you also need to install this plugin that we're going to be using called the Semi-Automatic Classification Plugin. We have included some helpful instructions for installation on our webinar webpage. In addition to the software, you need to download the data required for the exercise as well as complete the prerequisite homework assignment. So there's a Landsat 8 image that you need to download. Um, and please note that the prerequisite homework assignment gives you instructions on how to use that imagery um, using Glovis website. Um, however, just to give you a heads up, Glovis is undergoing some changes right now, so it's a little more difficult to access that website. So I would recommend using something like Earth Explorer to download your imagery if you haven't done so. And to make it easier for you, we've, we've um, provided some written instructions that's available on our website on how to download the imagery through Earth Explorer. As I mentioned previously, you can access all the course materials on the RSET website. Each week, you'll be able to find a PDF of the presentation that I'm going to be giving in both English and Spanish, um, the PDF of each week's in-class exercise, um, a link to view the recording of each week's webinar, and after week two, the PDF um, and the Google Forms of the homework assignment um, for homework submission.
For this course, I'm going to provide an overview of land cover classification and how it works. I will not be demonstrating how to acquire Landsat imagery this time, since that's covered in the prerequisite exercise. So hopefully, all of you should know how to do that. I will also provide step-by-step -step instruction on how to convert digital numbers to reflectance values, which we haven't done in the past, but we've had a lot of demand for it. Um, how to clip a Landsat image to a vector shape file, how to create training sites for a supervised classification, and how to analyze those training sites, and finally, how to create a land cover map. So this week, I'm going to give you an overview of land cover classification and provide instructions on how to do a basic supervised classification using the plugin in QGIS. Next week, I will show you how to analyze the training site statistics to refine your supervised classification. So this week, again, I'm going to give you a short lecture on land cover classification and then demonstrate, spend most of the time demonstrating an exercise on how to create this um, supervised land cover classification. As I mentioned before, because this course is four hours, the format allows you to do the exercise on your own and ask questions if you run into problems. So you can either follow me as I'm demonstrating the exercise um, or you can use the um, exercise, the written exercise and go through it yourself after I've done the demonstration. So first I'm gonna start with an overview of land cover classification. It's important that you understand the difference between a spectral class and an informational class. A spectral class is a group of pixels that are spectrally similar. An informational class is a land use or land cover class of interest, like water or forest or urban or agriculture. Image classification is the process of assembling groups of similar pixels into classes that are associated with an informational with informational land cover classes. So as shown in the um, images below, on the left-hand side is a satellite image of Panama, and on the right-hand side, that satellite image has been transformed into a land cover map. Just as a refresher, so all of you have should have seen this kind of figure before in the intro to remote sensing, um, each object on the Earth's surface has its own spectral signature. In this example, vegetation characteristic absorbs electromagnetic radiation in the red wavelengths, but refle reflects it in the near infrared. Soil, on the other hand, which is shown in the red line there, reflects higher radiation in the infrared wavelengths than the visible wavelengths. We can look at these objects a little differently if we plot um, one band against another. Actually, this is not the right slide, sorry. We'll do this one. We can look at these objects a little bit differently if we plot one band against another. In this case, um, we're plotting the band, Landsat band three. So this is Landsat actually five and seven, not Landsat eight, which is the red band versus Landsat band four, which is the near infrared. Um, so that results in water in the lower left because it has low reflectance in both bands vegetation on the lower right because it has low reflectance in the red band but high in the near infrared band and dry soil with higher reflectance in the red band but somewhere in between water and vegetation for the near infrared band. So the software uses this information to, to distinguish between different land cover types.
If we just focus on the vegetation spectral signature, but plot several types of vegetation, um, as shown here in this image, you will notice that although the general trend is the same, so you see that decrease in band three and that increase in band four, um, there's some variation between the different vegetation types. So the key to understanding how to do a land cover classification, and I can't stress this enough, is how to deal with this variability. Looking at the spectral signatures between vegetation and soil, you can see that it's easy to distinguish between vegetation and soil, right? So you see the different signatures in the, between the green lines and the red lines, but it's much more difficult to distinguish within these broad classes. If you translate the plot on the left to the plot on the right, you can see that some of the vegetation pixels are spread out, but some are quite close together. This is the same thing for the soil pixels. Right, so if you look at the circles within the green circle and within the red circle, there are some pixels that are really close together and some that are a little bit farther apart. Um, so if you want to distinguish between different vegetation types, you have to somehow figure out how to understand what that variation is. To make things even more confusing, we've been looking at spectral plots in two dimensions using only two image bands, so like the picture on the left there. Most of the time, you will be using more than two bands for classifying imagery, so the spectral plots become much more complicated. On the right-hand side, you can see what a spectral plot in three dimensions might look like. So if you have three bands instead of two, then your spectral plot um, gets, again, more complicated. So you can imagine how difficult it is to determine the pixel characteristics of land cover types in using five or six bands or in five or six dimensions. But fortunately, um, the software can do that for us. The process of image classification is defining the boundaries of classes in n-dimensional, and, and the dimensions stand for the number of bands that you're using in n-dimensional space using statistics of groups of pixels that represent land cover classes. Each group of pixels can be characterized by a variety of statistics, including the mean, the minimum value, the maximum value, and standard deviation. The standard deviation is important because it tells you how tight or how spread out that group of pixels is. In image classification, you can assign a class name to the group of pixels in the spectral plot and all the pixels in the image that fall within those class statistics are given those labels. For example, you may identify a few vegetation pixels in your image, but since you can't easily identified all the vegetation pixels in your image, the computer looks at all the pixels in the image that are similar to those pixels that you identified and labels those pixels as vegetation. And that's kind of a simple version of how classification works. There are many different ways to classify imagery but almost all can be categorized into two approaches, pixel-based and object-based. In pixel-based approaches, each pixel is grouped into a spectrally similar class. These approaches are most useful where there are multiple changes in land use within a short period of time, and they are best suited when there is wall-to-wall -wall data coverage and time series consistency at the pixel level is required. Object-based approaches partition an image into groups of pixels that are spectrally similar and spatially adjacent. Boundaries of pixel groups delineate ground objects in much the same way a human analyst would do based on shape, tone, and texture. This process is called segmentation. These kinds of images can be easier for an analyst to interpret. 
This approach is also used on radar imagery to reduce speckle. It's especially useful for high spatial resolution imagery because sometimes pixel-based approaches using that high spatial resolution imagery tend to be very noisy. The images below show the visual differences between the two approaches. On the left is the pixel-based approach, and on the right you can see the same image that has been segmented and classified. It produces a much smoother image. In this course, we're going to be using a pixel-based approach to image classification, but hopefully in the future um, we'll be able to do another course um, using the object-based approach. Two different methods are typically used to create land cover maps. The supervised method can use either a pixel-based approach or an object-based approach. The unsupervised method uses a pixel-based approach. The supervised method uses user-defined areas of known land cover types that are called training areas or training sites. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about that um, in the next several minutes. These areas are then used to de define the, st the statistical parameters of classification algorithms. The algorithm then automatically identifies and labels all pixels or segments that are statistically similar to the training data. In the unsupervised method, a classification algorithm assigns each pixel into one of a number of user-specified classes. Then interpreters assign each of the pixel groupings a value corresponding to a land cover class. This is the process flow of supervised and unsupervised classification methods. In the supervised method, you select training sites based on your local knowledge about the region. Then you evaluate and edit those training site signatures and classify the image. In the unsupervised approach, you run a clustering algorithm first to identify spectrally similar pixels. Then you identify classes in the image. Sometimes I like to run an unsupervised classification first just to get the feel for the spectral variation in the image. There are also ways you can do more of a hybrid approach where you do a supervised classification first using your training sites and then you can do an unsupervised approach for the pixels that were unclassified in the supervised approach. And the plugin that we're going to be using in QGIS actually um, allows you to do that. A supervised classification method requires the analyst to select training areas where they know what is on the ground. And this is the key to the supervised approach, is that you have to have enough knowledge about what's on the ground in order to collect those spectral signatures. Then you digitize a polygon within that area. Or if the image has been segmented, then the analyst identifies segments associated with the known land cover types. These known land cover types can be identified through a lot of different methods. Um, that includes going out and doing field work, um, or you could use visual interpretation of high resolution aerial photos or high resolution satellite imagery like QuickBird. Each known area has its own statistical characteristics or spectral signature. The image shows three simplified land cover types, conifers, water, and deciduous vegetation and their associated spectral signatures. The spectral signatures from the training areas are then used to categorize each pixel or each segment in the image, resulting in the entire image being classified. Actually, that isn't always true. Um, different algorithms do it differently. And sometimes an entire image may not get classified if there are pixels that don't fit well into those spectral signatures. And there's ways we, you can deal with that. And we'll talk about that during the exercise. Sometimes the pixels, um, since they don't fit the spectral characteristics of the training si um, signatures, then you can use an unsupervised approach or you can actually alter the statistics of your spectral signatures 
to incorporate more pixels. So there's some key characteristics of training sites that you need to know. As a general rule, if you're using n bands of data, then you should collect more than 10 n pixels of training data for each class. Because a lot of people say, well, how many pixels should I collect for each um, training site? So this is just a, a general rule. Um, however, in reality, it's not really a huge concern um, because most people will not bother to determine the total number of pixels for each class. Um, the point is that you want to make sure you collect an adequate number of pixels per class, and some of the next rules will, will actually address that. The size of the training site must be large enough to provide accurate pixel values, but not too large to include pixels that don't really belong to that class. And I'll show you pictures of what that looks like in a minute. It's important to select training sites in various parts of the image, not just one small area. And this is really important because there's spectral variation um, throughout an image. Um, and so you don't wanna be collecting your training sites in, in just one part of your image. You actually wanna collect training sites if you have training, uh, if you have those kind of land cover um, areas throughout your image, sort of in different parts of your image. It's also important that you have more than one training site per class. So again, to capture all the spectral variation in a particular land cover class, you want to have, you definitely want, want to have more than one training site per class um, and, you know, ideally maybe five to ten per class minimum. And lastly, and probably most importantly, each training site should have a fairly homo has, should have fairly homogeneous pixels. Um, the idea with all of these rules is to make sure that you're capturing the variability of each class, but not too much variability. This is demonstrating what I mean by capturing the appropriate variability or minimizing confusion. Minimizing confusion between classes will be one of your biggest challenges in land cover classification. Confusion between classes can be caused by land cover types that are spectrally similar, and there's a lot of those, as you'll see when we do our exercise, um, by shadows or clouds, or by training sites that are delineated too broadly. So the image on the left, and it's a bit, it's a bit extreme, but you get the idea, um, shows a training site that's been delineated too broadly because it includes roads and bare ground as well as agricultural fields. So all the red squares that we're seeing in there um, are all fields that have been planted. They're all agricultural fields. All the kind of bluish areas there are also agricultural fields, but they are not planted. And then you'll see lines between them and those are the roads. So if you're interested in collecting a training site for a particular field or for crops, um, that image on the left is not a good way to collect a training site because not only are you getting crops, but you're getting um, some of the road pixels as well. The image on the right actually shows you a better way to collect training sites. Um, and you can see there's a couple different vegetation fields in that one that are just getting the vegetation, um, but still capturing the variability within the field. Um, and then you see sort of other field three and four that are catch capturing those fields that are not planted. Um, and again, you can still see a lot of spectral variability within those fields and you want to capture that. So you can see how challenging um, this process can be. So now we'll talk more specifically about getting training site information. There's a couple different ways you can select training sites. Most image processing software packages will offer both methods. One is by digitizing your own polygon, as shown on the left. So in that area, we have a large lake um, there on the left. That's actually Lake Tahoe. Um, and I've digitized a square polygon, a square training site within that large lake. So this is good for large areas like lakes. Um, that are fairly homogeneous 
Um, you have to be a little careful with this approach because it's easy to capture pixels that you may, may not want to include. So sometimes if you're catching, if you're doing a training site and you're and you're drawing your own training site, you have to zoom way, way, way in so you know exactly what you're getting. The second way on the right hand side is called region growing, which is um, which is shown sort of in the in the image on the right. And I'll explain a little bit more what this is on the next slide. But this approach is good for areas that have a lot of spectral variability. Region growing tools allow you to create training sites based on spectral characteristics. So you can select an area where you would like to create a training site and use some kind of a pointer tool to select a pixel and those we called seed pixels. The software will then select adjacent pixels within a spectral and size threshold that you choose. So you need to understand the pixel values in your image. An image that's been converted to reflectance will have much different pixel values than one that, that does not has not been um, converted. Similarly, a Landsat 8 image that hasn't been converted to reflectance will have, um, have much different pixel values than a Landsat 5 image because the Landsat 8 image is 8 is 12 bit and the Landsat 5 image is 8 bit. So your total spectral um, values are going to be much different. So for example, an image that has been converted to reflectance values, which range from 0 to 1, may have a spectral threshold of um, 0 0.01 or 0 0.04 or 0 0.08, something like that. If you want to make the threshold small enough, um, so you are only including pixels of interest, but you also make on a want to make it big enough to include an adequate number of pixels. So these are all things that we'll kind of play around with um, using QGIS, and you'll see the difference between choosing a smaller threshold versus choosing a larger threshold. This is an example of how region growing works. In this example, the central pixel um, in image A is known as the C pixel. And it's the starting point to grow a region. If you specify the spectral distance as 0.1, the minimum size of the region as one pixel, and the maximum width as five pixels, as defined on the right-hand side, then the algorithm will pick the pixels shown in image C in the lower left there. And then finally, image D shows what the region looks like after it's selected. Once training sites are selected, classification algorithms are used to classify the whole image by comparing spectral characteristics of each pixel to the spectral characteristics of the training sites. There are many different kinds of algorithms out there. The plugin that we're going to use in, G in QGIS has three algorithms, um, minimum distance, maximum likelihood, and spectral angle mapping. These methods use different approaches to define the classes. The next slide shows how minimum distance and maximum likelihood work. For a minimum distance, the mean value for each class in each band is calculated and a pixel is assigned to a class which has the shortest Euclidean distance to that mean. This algorithm is mathematically simple and computationally efficient, but it's not necessarily good for classes that may be spectrally similar to each other. Maximum likelihood on the right uses the mean and standard deviations to calculate the probability that a pixel falls within a particular class. This algorithm tends to be computationally more intensive, but it allows for pixels to be classified to a class even though it may not be closest to its mean. 
So I think the more popular of the two here is maximum likelihood. Um, the one I'm not explaining is the spectral angle mapping, and that is often used for hyperspectral imagery. So we'll be really focusing uh, in our exercise on using maximum likelihood. So next I'm going to talk a little bit about QGIS. So hopefully by now, you all know that QGIS is freely available, open source, geospatial software that has many of the same functions as ArcGIS. It can run on Macs or PCs, um, and plugins are the main tools that allow users to do specific processing steps and for more advanced analyses. You can use similar file types that you would with ArcGIS as well, like shapefiles, geotiffs, and geodatabases. It's important that you have a basic understanding of the geospatial software for this webinar series. Please make sure you have QGIS downloaded and properly installed before trying to complete any of the exercises. In this course, we'll be using a plugin called the Semi-Automatic Classification Plugin developed by Luca Congito. This is really an amazing plugin that allows you to download several types of imagery, pre-process imagery, select and analyze training sites, and use various algorithms to classify the image. We're not going to be going through all of these things that it allows you to do, um, but I highly encourage you to download the documentation for this plugin, which is really thorough and helpful. It will give you information on many more things you can do with this plugin than I will be able to show you in this course. So here's the process flow we will use to conduct a supervised classification um, this week and next week. So this week, we will convert the image to surface reflectance, subset the image, set the input image, create the training input file, and create regions of interest or training sites. So I'm going to kind of use those terms interchangeably. Uh, regions of interest is what the QGIS plugin calls them, um, but they are the same thing as training sites. Um, so just to not to get you confused. Um, we will also create a classification preview and create a land cover map this week. So next week, we're going to create more regions of interest and then learn how to analyze them and create a land cover map, um, a more refined land cover map. Before we get started, I also need to clarify how the plugin allows you to define land cover classes. You can define two levels of classes. There's a macro class and a regular class. This week, we will define the macro class as the broader land cover category, uh, similar to what you're seeing here. And then the class is going to be more specific class. For example, in this example, macro class can be vegetation, and the classes can be grasses and trees. Next week, we're actually going to do things a little bit differently, but for this week, we're going to follow this same kind of approach. Lastly, I want to make sure that you please take advantage of the great support network for QGIS. Since I am by no means a QGIS expert um, and will not be answering general questions about QGIS in this course, I encourage you to all, all of you to seek out these different avenues if you have quest other questions about QGIS. The user guide and training manual has many similar exercises that will guide you through different tasks. Um, you can also use Stack Exchange for specific questions that can't be answered from the user guide and tutorials. Additionally, the QGIS website has case studies that highlight new tools or techniques that may be useful for your analysis. And again, I can't stress enough um, for those of you that are interested in um, this land cover classification is to download 
the um, manual that's associated with the plugin because it's it has some really great information in it. So now we're going to move on to today's exercise. So this is going to be fun. Hold, bear with me while I switch um, a little bit here. I'm going to go to QGIS. And for those of you that are following along, hopefully you have the exercise in front of you. Um, and it should, you, you should be able to get it through um, our website. And it says exercise one supervised classification. So I'm going to follow along with that. Hopefully you can follow along too. Again, I'll be giving the demonstration on how to do this classification. And then um, at the end of it, you will have the whole rest of your time to do it yourself. Um, and I will stay online to answer any questions you might have or any problems that you might run into. So hopefully you can all see the QGIS interface right here. Um, just to kind of remind you of what, what we're seeing here, um, we have, I already have the, um, the plugin installed. So if you look, I have it also as a um, tab um, with the layers panel. So I have the layers panel right now showing, and this is how you can display imagery in QGIS. And then I have the plugin dock next to that, um, which is right here. So we'll kind of be going back and forth between those two. Um, I'm going to start off um, with the layers panel. And the first thing you want to do with QGIS, no matter what you're doing, even if it's a classification or not, is you want to start a new project and give it a name. So in order to do that, you go up to the project, to the menu toolbar, up to project, um, and say new, okay? And that kind of clears out everything that's there. And then um, once you get started, we can start it right now, but we can save as, and then you'll want to save it, give it some kind of name. And in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it a name, Calaveras class is what I'm going to call it. Um, and the reason it's called Calaveras is because that's the county that we're going to be doing the classification on. It's a county um, in California, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. All right, so if you've done the prerequisite, hopefully you have the imagery already um, downloaded. Um, I'm hoping that you have that imagery downloaded because I'm not going to be showing you that here. So the first thing we're going to do is we're actually going to pre-process the imagery. So if you look up at the toolbars on the top, there's a lot of tool toolbars. The top layer, the top row is the QGIS toolbars. Then the third row is actually the plugin toolbar. So you see all of these things around here. That's all we're going to be using for the SCP, the plugin. So the first thing we're going to do is click on the pre-processing icon, which is this one right here. It's an arrow to a blue thing. And the the plugin, all the different things you can do with a plugin will will pop up. So you can see that here. And I already have, there's a pre-processing tab already selected. You can see a lot of other tabs along here as well. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to go to the directory con containing your Landsat bands. So as I mentioned in the exercise, um, it's important that you have all the Landsat bands, including this MTL file, um, in one directory, and nothing else should be in that directory. You should only have um, those Landsat bands in the directory. So, and I'll show you what I mean. If I go to that directory, I'm going to navigate to this. KGIS, Landsat. Okay, so here's my directory right here. So as you can see, 
this is the name of the Landsat image right there. So in that directory, if I were to, oh, you can't see it, but it, um, in that directory are all the Landsat bands and only the Landsat bands. There should be nothing else inside there. So I'm going to select that, select the folder, and what happens is if you look down, um, oops, I lost it. Here it is. If you look down at the metadata, all the metadata for those bands will appear. You can see that. You can see the radiance. You can see reflectance. Uh, you can see all kinds of things here. Um, and this is all information that's needed in order to convert it to reflectance values. Okay. Um, the next thing, it says select MTL file, but you don't have to select that file um, if it's in the directory. So if you download the imagery from Globus or Earth Explorer, that MTL file should be in there already. So I do not need to um, go to that directory for the MTL file. Then the other thing you want to do is click right here where it says apply um, DOS1 atmospheric correction. And then you also want to click this one, create band set and use band set tools. And I'll explain why you need to do that in a minute. Okay, so and this is all you need to do. The next thing you do, and I'm not going to do this right now because it takes a long time to run this process. So hopefully a lot of you have already done this, but if you haven't done it, um, you can start doing it now, and it'll probably take anywhere from, depending on your computer, from five to ten minutes to actually run uh, this process. So you click, click this little icon, which is the, like the run icon in the lower right-hand corner, um, and that will run the process. So I'm going to leave this up right now, and I'm actually going to display the corrected imagery. Okay, so this is what you should see once that process is done. These are all the different bands that have been corrected to reflectance from 1 um, to 11, and you can see they're all displaying here as they go along. It takes a little while to display them all. Um, and they're all black and white because you're only looking at single bands. We're not combining anything yet. Um, and so, and as you notice, the name of the imagery has RT in front of it. So you know those are the corrected ones because it has RT in front of it. So hopefully that's fairly straightforward for you. Just remember, it takes a while. Um, and two, just remember, I'm displaying this in the layers panel right now. So we have, everything will pop up in the layers panel. So the next thing we want to do is actually combine the bands that we're interested into one file. And the plugin will do that for us. So if we go back to the same, the same um, box that we use for the pre-processing and we click on band set, like this this one right here. So right now there's nothing in it because I didn't actually run um, the pre-processing um, today. But if I had, what we would see is something like this. So I have a picture of it. If you click on band set, and you can see in this Word document, um, that the top where it says band list gives you the whole list of bands. And the bottom, gives you the just the bands that you're going to be using for this classification. So as you can see, it's bands th 2 through band 7 for Landsat 8. Okay, so I wanted to show you this just because, um, since I'm not running through this process, because this actually takes a little while as well. So I wanted to have um, the imagery all ready for you. So once you get those bands um, in place there, you'll click this box right down here that says create raster of band set or stack bands. And then you click the run button, which is on the lower right hand side again. And that will put all of those bands into one file. 
And I'm going to show you, I'm also going to bring up that imagery. It's this one right here. So that image, see now we see some color and we'll change that color in a minute, but that will have the RT in the front and then the suffix will say B stack raster. So you know that image is the one where all the bands have been put together. So just to make things a little simpler, I'm going to turn off all the other images because we really don't need those to do what we're going to do. I'm going to turn everything off here. Okay, and the first thing we want to do is make those colors look a little nicer because they look a little strange. Um, so if you guys have done QGIS before, the way to change the colors is to right click on the image and go to properties. And then once you're in properties, we're going to click on the left. Mine was already there to under style. There's a bunch of options there on the left hand side, general, style, transparency, etc. But we're going to click on the style. Um, we're going to change the bands that are in these red bands. So what we want to have is band five in the red band, band four in the green band, and we can leave band three in the blue band. For contrast enhancement, we want to make sure it says stretch to min max. And then on the right hand side, we want to click load. So that changes these min max values as you notice. And then we just click OK. And in a minute, a new image will pop up where the colors look a lot nicer. So let's take a look at this image for a second. Um, since um, a lot of you may not know California very well, um, this is actually an image that covers actually half of kind of half of California, half of Nevada. So on the left or the um, western side is California, and where there's no vegetation on the right hand side, um, most of that's Nevada. In the middle, you see a big lake. Um, that's Lake Tahoe, one of the largest um, lakes in the, in the US. Um, and all this green that you see here is all the Sierra Nevada uh, mountain range. So it's all forested. Um, and at the higher elevations, we typically have um, conifers, mostly just conifers, so pine trees. Um, and at the lower elevations, as you kind of go down to the left, um, it turns into more deciduous uh, vegetation and oak type of trees. So from hard, from softwoods to hardwoods. Um, and then as you go even further left, um, it gets down into some flat areas that um, it, the pink areas are sort of like bare ground, bare soil. You will also see some large sort of brown scars in the forested areas and those are actually large forest fires that have taken place in the last several years um, from some very large forest fires um, and so those are very apparent in this in this image but we're not going to want to actually um, do a supervised classification of this entire image because it would just take too long and we're not interested in the whole image. So what we're going to do is clip this image to a vector layer that we have. So in order to do that, I need to display the vector layer. So I'm still in the layers pan panel here. I'm going to go to the left hand side and it says at the very top, there's an icon that says add vector layer. So I'm going to click on that and up will pop a box that says add vector layer and below source where it says data set I'm going to browse to where that vector layer is um, and luckily for me um, it popped up the vector layer popped up right um, where I wanted it to pop up. So I'm going to click on calaveras.shape. So this is a shape file. 
and open that up and then say open. And you'll see it pop up in your layers panel, but um, for some of you, it may not actually pop up in the image. And as you notice, it didn't pop up in my image. So that's because the Calaveras um, shapefile and the image are in two different projections. So in order to make that Calaveras shapefile appear, we need to go down to the lower right um, where it says EPSG, and then it gives a number, and you click on that. And another box will show up. And in order to make that shapefile appear, you need to click this little box on the top that says Enable On The Fly CRS Transformation. So it will automatically, as ArcGIS and other software packages do, allow you to display two different geospatial data types, even though they're different um, projections. So then we just say, OK, and wait a minute. And there we go. So now you can see this is a county. So California um, and other states in the United States are divided into administrative counties. Um, and this particular county is called Calaveras County. Um, and it's actually where my dad lives. And as you can see, it actually doesn't cover the whole, the image doesn't cover the whole county, but that's okay. We're only going to be classifying part of the image. And because I think many of you will be interested in using some kind of an administrative boundary to um, to clip your imagery. So you, we wanted to make sure to show you that. So let's clip it. Um, to do that, we'll go to raster at the top and we go to extraction and then we go to clipper. So the clipper box comes up, the dialog box, and in the top you can see that the B-Stack raster image is already there. So that's the one we want to use. Then the output file, we actually want to give it a name. And I'm going to call this output file Landsat underscore Calaveras. You can call it whatever you want. Just remember what you um, what you called it. And then you and then Keep the file type as GeoTIFF. Then we'll say save. Then the next thing we want to do is make sure our no data value is zero and that the clipping mode will be mask layer. If you have some, some um, coordinates, for an area that you'd like to clip, you can use that too with the extent. So this allows you to put coordinates in there. Um, or you can drag, um, you can draw a box or something on your image. But we have the Calaveras mask layer, so we're going to use that. So when we select mask layer, you can see there it says Calaveras, and that's what we want. Uh, we also want to make sure that down on the left-hand side, it says load into canvas when finished. You want to make sure that's clicked on. Now we just click OK. And it will clip the image. It takes a, takes a minute or so. Mine's taking a little bit longer. And then when it's done, a little box that comes up, it says processing completed. So you say, OK. And then you close the Clipper dialog box. So now your image looks a little weird. So we're going to fix that. Um, we're going to turn off the larger image. We're going to turn off the vector file. And we're left with our Landsat Calaveras. So to zoom into that, you can actually click on 
this um, icon at the very top. And we'll use this a lot, especially when we're doing training sites. Um, it's called Zoom Full. If you click on that, it'll go zoom right into that image. So again, the colors on this are really kind of um, strange. So we're going to fix the colors doing the same way that we did the larger image. We're going to click, use your right hand, right click on the image name, go to properties, and then once you do that, you'll be in style. We'll change the band one for the red band to band five band four for the green band and keep the blue band at band three. Make sure contrast enhancement is stretched to min max. Um, click load on the right and you'll see the values change here and then say okay. And there we go. We've got an image that looks a lot nicer in my opinion. So let's take a look at, <clears throat> excuse me, let's take a look at this image a bit. Um, because you kind of have to understand this image before we start getting into training sites. Because as I said before, to do a supervised classification, you really have to understand, you know, what it is that's on the ground and what land cover classes you're interested in um, classifying. So in this image, you can clearly see a fire scar. It's from the Butte fire that started on September 9th in 2015. So that's this big purple area right here. It's a huge fire scar. So the forested area, which is all the green, extend from the lower elevations in the west or the left to the higher elevations in the east. And as you can see, there are both light and dark green vegetated areas. So in the lower elevation, sort of on the south facing slopes, the vegetation generally consists of oaks, oak trees and shrubs. Um, the dark green vegetation is mostly conifers or pine trees. So you're also um, going to see some small lakes in this image. So there's a large reservoir down here to the west of the fire scar. You can see that right here. And then to the right of the fire scar, there's some smaller lakes. There's a really small lake um, right here, and there's another one right here. And then if you look further east of the fire scar, um, and we'll zoom in a little bit later to see this more closely. Um, from a bit of a distance, you can see these little patchy areas. Um, what that is, is logging companies going in and logging the forest. So they've clear, um, clear cut patches in that forest to take the trees for harvest. And then these pink areas that are to the west of the fire scar are areas with um, little to no vegetation. They're much more sort of um, lower elevation. Um, and in, this is late summer. So uh, in California, the grasslands go brown. Um, and in the winter and the spring, they are green. So this will look much different um, in a winter scene than it is does in the summer scene. And the winter scene, it'll be all green. So this is just to orient yourself um, to what's going on in this image. Okay, so now let's get started with our supervised classification. So in this portion of the exercise, we're going to do a classification using regions of interest. Um, again, those are the same things as training sites. So to do that, I'm going to click now, the way I have my um, QGIS set up is I have a tab here in the lower left called SCP Doc. So I'm going to click on that tab. So to start off with, we need to tell the computer, the software, what image we're going to be classifying. So we'll do that right up here. So if you click on the triangle, you'll probably see nothing up here. So I click on that, there's nothing there. Okay, so in order to make our image appear, you have to click on this 
um, refresh button on the right hand side. So I'll click on that. And then if I click on the tri triangle again, you'll see Landsat Cal Calaveras. So select that. So that will go in the input image. Then we're going to want to create a training input file. And um, so you would click on this icon right here that says create a new training input. So I'm going to go um, navigate to the directory that you are interested in. Um, and in this case, my directory is called uh, Landsat. And then I'm going to uh, um, call my training input training, and I'm going to call it session one for this week. Training underscore session one. And that will be, it's saved as this SCP file. So you'll see that appear. Um, under training input on the right hand side. So the way this uh, plugin works is you identify the image, you name the training input, and now we're going to start collecting training sites. So in order to do that, and this is kind of hard to see sometimes if you haven't used this before, is you go down to the bottom here and it says classification doc. And then this other whole um, dialog box will kind of pop up there. So you'll see ROI signature list on the top. And then halfway down, you'll see ROI creation. So these are what we're going to be using for the next little while. But before we do that, it's really important for you to identify what your land cover classes are going to be. So I'm going to show you a Word document right now. This is our exercise document on what classes we're going to define. So that should show up here in a second. There they are. So again, this is in our um, exercise document. We're going to define for this first exercise, it's going to be very basic. We're going to define six land cover classes. We have um, water. We have two kinds of forest. We have conifers, oak and shrub forest, and then we have three types of bare ground. We have burn, so that large burn scar. We have forest harvest, which is the area that's been cut by the timber companies. Um, and then we have bare ground, um, so other. So that's basically all of those areas that are um, sort of those, that pinkish color. So we're keeping it very simple right now, just so you can get the idea of how this whole thing works. But it's really important that you define the land cover classes before you start any of your uh, supervised classification. And as I explained before, the way this plugin works, um, and I'm going back to the plugin right now, is you will see the MC, which is sort of the master class, the overall class, and then the C, which is the, the class. So what I ha like to do is create a table, and this helps me keep everything straight. I'm going to bring back the, the document, our exercise document, and show you the table I created. And this is what I'm going to refer to as I'm creating um, my training sites. And this week, again, it's really simple. Next week, it's going to get a little bit more complicated. So it's even more important that you create these tables before you start collecting the training sites so you can keep everything straight. So in this table on the left-hand side, you can see the macro class names that I just showed you. Water, two vegetations, three bare grounds. And each ID number will match um, the class name, right? So water is one, vegetation is two, bare ground is three. So we have three macro classes. And then the class name are the subclasses underneath the, each macro class. So for water, we have lake. For vegetation, we have forest and oak scrub, shrub. For bare ground, we have burned, forest harvest, and other. And then the class ID um, 
for this exercise, and again, you can do this different ways, but for this exercise, I've given each class name a different class ID. Um, so each class name will have a macro class ID and a class ID, okay? So these are the things that you need to keep clear um, before you start doing training site classification. So I'm going to use this table now to create training sites. So the way to collect a, a training site, there's various ways in, there's two ways actually in the plugin. So if you look at the um, toolbar across the top, you'll see right in the middle, there's a, an ROI um, radio button that you can click on and you can click off. So we're gonna want to make sure that's on. And then next to that, button where it says ROA, uh, ROI, you're going to see kind of this funny shape, um, which is uh, create a ROI polygon. And then next to that, you're going to see a box with a square on it that says activate ROI pointer. So the first thing we're going to do is create a training site for our water class um, using the ROI polygon. Okay, so in order to create training sites, um, and I recommend this um, no matter which method you're using, is to zoom in to the area um, that you want to create your training site. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to click on the zoom tool. I'm going to zoom in since water and lake is our first class. I'm going to zoom in to this lake right here. So now you can see the, the lake zoomed in. And we're going to create a polygon in here. Uh, remember I told you there's two ways to do training sites. You can do your own polygon, or you can select a pixel and do the region growing. So first, we're going to do a polygon. Polygons are great for areas where you have um, large areas that are homogeneous. So lakes are great because um, a lot of these pixels in this lake are very, very similar. So in order to do that, you're going to click on the create an ROI polygon icon. You're going to go down into the lake. You're going to left click your first point. Oops, let me get there. Oh, there it is. So when your first point clicks, you'll see a little red X. Then your second point, You'll, again, you'll left click and you'll see a line form. Your third point, again, you left click. And in the fourth point, you can actually right click and it will close the polygon. And that is your first training site right there. So that will be water. So these are only temporary until you save them. So it's really easy if you make a mistake or something like that, or you want to move it, is you just, um, you don't have to delete this one. You can actually just um, digitize a new one. So on the left-hand side in the SCP doc, we want to make sure our MC ID is one and our C ID is one because that matches with our water and our lake. And then the info, you'll actually write the names in. So MC info will be water. C info will be lake. And then once you do that, to save this signature, you have to collect the save temporary ROI to training input, this little icon right here. And when you do that, you'll see the signature pop up in the signature list. So it says, um, it's the signature, it tells you the MC ID, the C ID, the label, this, the class label, which is Lake, and then a color. And don't worry about the color for now, we'll be able to change that later, because we probably don't want to have Lake, Lake as green, but we'll change that later. Now remember for this exercise, we're only going to create one um, training site for each class. 
However, in reality, you're going to want to, you know, collect a lot more training sites for each class. But this is just to show you the process. Next week, we'll do things a little bit different. So I'm going to zoom back out. So remember, I'm going to use this tool that allows me to zoom to the full image. And then I'm going to look at my table again. I'm going to bring this back for you to look at. And my next class is going to be, actually my next two classes are going to be vegetation classes. So as you see, I have vegetation forest and I have vegetation oak scrub. And notice the class IDs. It'll be two, two, and two, three, okay? So first, I'm going to do vegetation forest. So in order to do that, I want to zoom in to a forested area. I'm going to go way to the east here and kind of get an area that has some light and dark vegetation. And I'm going to zoom in. And this, if for this training site, I'm actually going to use the region growing tool. So I'm going to cl click on activate ROI pointer. But actually, before I do that, you remember that you can specify the spectral distance and the size of your training sites that you want. So in order to do that, I'm actually, right now the distance says 0.01. I'm going to increase that distance to 0 0.08. Now you can play around with this a little bit and I'll show you what happens when you do change it. Then I'm going to click again on that activate ROI pointer and I'm going to select somewhere in sort of the darker green vegetation. So maybe around here and I'm just going to click. So as you can see, there's a training site that pops up there and a region of interest. And all of those pixels that are in that orange color are similar um, pixel values to each other within 0 0.08 pixel values to each other. And you can see it's a very irregular shaped um, polygon and it, ex it excludes pixels that are not within that same distance area. Now, since this is a temporary polygon, I'm going to show you what happens if you decrease the distance if we go back to 0 0.01. So I'm going to go back to 0 0.01. I'm going to click on my pointer again, and I'm going to select somewhere else in the image. I'm going to select there. So when I do that, you can see how much smaller that region of interest, that training site is, because you've decreased the spectral distance by so much. So you are really gonna have to kind of figure out what kind of training site works best for um, the land cover class that you're interested in. For now though, I'm gonna go back to the 0 0.08. I like the larger size and I'm, I'm my training class, I mean, my land cover classes are so broad that I want them to include more pixels. So I'm going to go back to what we just did. So that's our training class for vegetation slash forest. Now, if you remember right, now we have to label that this training class, right? So the, the, the math macro class ID is going to be two. For forest, that remains as two, but we're gonna change the info to vegetation, which is the macro class, and the subclass is called forest. And then you save that. Okay. Then our next class is also vegetation, but it's gonna be the oak shrub class. So I'm actually gonna zoom back out and I'm gonna go where I know there's more sort of oak and shrub, which is kind of down in this lower elevation area. So you still see green there, but it's a different kind of green. Actually, there's several different kinds of green there, but we're just gonna kind of pick one. Um, 
And again, I'm going to use the region growing tool because there's so much variability around here. Um, and I'm going to drop it in one of my green pixels here. And again, it creates a fairly large um, training site. And I'll go to my ROI creation side and the vegetation macro class ID is going to remain as two because it's vegetation. The oak shrub class ID is three. So these all stay the same. I'm just going to change my C info to oak slash shrub. And then I'm going to save it. So next we're going to do our three bare ground classes. I'm going to zoom back out. And the first one is the burned area. So I'm going to zoom in to the burned area. Oh, wait till you see that. Okay, so if you look at this burned area, it's kind of interesting because there, there's a lot of spectral variability here. Um, and that's just something to keep in mind when you're collecting um, training sites is to make sure you're capturing all that spectral variability. Um, and to do that, and we'll do this next week, is um, the best way to do it is to really make sure you're getting more than one um, training site per class. Um, this week we're only going to do one training site, so we're not going to capture all the spectral variability probably, but you can see why we need to do that. So I'm going to click on again on the activate ROI pointer. I'm going to click somewhere in the purple area and a huge training site will appear. So the macro class for, for bare ground is three. So I need to increase my MCID to three. For burned, this, the class ID will stay as four. I'll change MC info to bare ground and I'm going to change C info to burned. Okay, and I'm going to just bring up the table again to show you what I'm doing. Just so you don't get confused. Again, I highly recommend that you have a table next to you when you do this. So here's where we're at, where we are right now. We're doing we just did the bare ground macro class with a class ID of 3. The class name is burned and that class ID is four, okay? So the next three, we're gonna have a macro I cl class ID is three, and then the class ID will increase for the three different bare ground areas. All right, so going back to our image, we haven't saved our signature yet, so we make sure to save our image, our signature. <laughs> And you'll see a pop up under the ROI signature list here. Again, don't worry about the colors. We'll change those in a minute. So after bare ground burned, we're going to do bare ground forest harvest. So I'm going to zoom back out to the whole image. Um, and and I, I can't stress enough how much you need to zoom in and out and in and out all the time when you're doing these um, Spectral these training classes. So we're going to go into zoom into a an area that I know has a lot of these clear cut areas. So as you can see, this is a forested area. All these little squares in here have been areas that have been cut. Um, the forest has been cut down for timber sales. And you can see again, there's a, a lot of spectral variability. The very pink areas are sort of newly cut areas. Then you see there are also areas that have a little bit of green on them. And that means they've probably been cut a little while ago and there's some vegetation regrowing. And then you can also see some outlines of areas that have been cut, um, but have a lot of vegetation growing back. Um, what we're interested in for this particular land cover classification are the areas that have been um, cut and cleared with no, well with not much vegetation yet because this is a bare ground class. So I'm going to select my activate ROI pointer again. I'm going to drop, put the crosshairs in one of the areas I'm interested, in, and I'm going to select. Um, 
create a region of interest in there. And you can see this one's much smaller, of course, because it's surrounded by forest. When I go back to my table, bare ground is three, forest harvest is five, so the numbers look good. I just need to change my C info to forest harvest and, and then save that signature. So now that appears in the ROI signature list. And lastly, our very last class is going to be called Other. That's kind of a catch-all. Um, so Other, I'm calling all of this bare ground that's kind of down to the west of this burn scar. So all of these sort of pink and white areas that you see in kind of purpley colors. This is all in the winter, it's normally grassland, so it's green. Um, but since this is sort of a late summer image, everything's brown, it's dry or bare ground. So this is what we're gonna try to classify, get a good training site for this area. So again, I'm going to select my um, pointer tool you can choose either one. You can choose the polygon making one or the pointer tool. I like the pointer tool, so I'm going to use that. I'm going to plop it in one of the bare ground areas, and it creates this huge um, training site. And then I'm going to go to ROI creation, and my bare ground number is three. My other class ID is six. The MC info is still bare ground, but I'm going to change C info to other. And I'm going to save that one. Okay, I'm just going to go back to this table to show you one more time what I just did. So as you can see, this last one, we just did bare ground forest harvest, and that had a class ID as five, and the bare ground other has a class ID as six. Okay, so these are all our classes now. It's not very many, but it's so you can get the idea of what we're doing. Okay, so now once you do this, you can, um, this plugin is great because it allows you to do a preview classification. So you can kind of take a look at how well you've collected signatures because um, it will classify pixels within a specific area, but without having to classify the whole image, because sometimes um, that takes a long time. So first we're going to do a preview classification. So I'm going to zoom back out to the whole image. And this is the point where we want to change colors because in the preview classification, you'll actually see the pixels and the colors that you want your final classification to be. So in order to do that, up here in the ROI signature list, um, we are going to change the colors. So to do that, you double click in the color box and then you'll see, um, you'll see a color table appear. Now I notice that in this particular version of um, QGIS um, and the fact that I'm using a, P P, um, a PC rather than a Mac, um, that my color table looks a little bit different than it did on my Mac. So on my Mac, um, and I think I have a new version, newer version of QGIS on my Mac, um, you have various options um, to choose colors. There's, um, it's kind of cool, it has these little crayons that come up or there's various things you can choose. So you may see that when you double click on your color, you may not see exactly this, but just to let you know, there's various ways you can choose colors. Um, in this particular version on my PC, I only have one way I can choose colors. So um, we're going to, the first one is lake. So let's make lake blue. I'm going to choose a blue color and say OK. And then the color changes to blue. So forest, we're going to do the same. Let's change it to like a, a dark forest green. And we'll say OK. And then the oak shrub, let's change that to a light green. 
we say, okay. And for the burned area, let's change that to a purple, maybe a darker purple. We'll do, I'm terrible with colors. Okay, let's do dark purple. And let's do forest harvest, let's make that orange. And this, all of these colors just enable to you to see the different classes better. And then other, let's change that to like a light yellow. Okay. And then you can customize any of this, as you can see from the color chart there. But we'll just leave it like this. All right, so we're going to go further down the um, SCP doc. And if you click on macro classes first, the one thing I wanted to show you is that you can actually choose to classify your image either with the macro classes or with the classes. It just depends on how you have things set up. This week, we're actually going to um, we're actually going to classify the image with uh, classes and not the macro classes, but next week um, we're going to use the macro classes. So when you do that, you can see you can change the colors of your macro classes too um, here if you're interested in doing that. But we're just going to use the classes, so we're going to keep things as the same. To set things up for the preview, you need to go again to the toolbar across the top. And if you look on the far right hand side, um, past where it says the ROI information, you'll see preview and you'll see a radio button that you can click on and off. Um, and it should be on. You can see I can click it off or I can click it on. And then to the right of that, and I'm actually going to make my um, window a little bit bigger so you can see everything. You'll see um, a button where it says activate classification preview pointer. So that is where you want to create your preview. And then on the to the right of that, you'll see a T and that stands for setting the preview transparency. So that allows you if you want to make it a little more transparent so you can see underneath it, you can increase that number. We're going to keep it at zero for right now. Um, but as you play around with it a little bit, you can play around with that transparency. And then the S is actually the size of the preview. So how many pixels um, will that preview be? And right now it's set for S equals 200. Why don't we increase that to 500? So we want the size of our preview to be 500 by 500 pixels. Okay, so we get that all set up. Then we're going to go click on the um, SCP doc. We're going to click on classification algorithm. And once you do that, you can see where you can use the macro class ID or you can use the class ID. So we want to make sure it's set to class ID, CID right now, because that's what we're going to use to classify our image. These other things, um, for the algorithm, why don't we set that as maximum likelihood? Right now, the default is minimum distance, but we'll change that to maximum likelihood. And then below that, you see something called land cover signature classification. We aren't going to do anything um, with that right now. We'll be working with that next week. Um, but that allows you to sort of play with the statistics of your signatures a little bit more. And then you can also do a hybrid classification using this approach. But we won't do that for right now. Okay. And then the last tab where it says classification output, we're not going to actually run that um, until we're ready to run the whole classification. So at this point, we can do the preview. So in order to do that, we're going to go back to the top where it says preview. We're going to click on activate classification preview pointer. Right there, click on that. And then we're going to put that pointer somewhere where we want to see 
a preview classification. And we can do this various times if you want to look at various parts of your image. So right now, I'm going to click just to the east of the burn scar, kind of by that little lake there. I'm just going to click right in there. And you'll see it running. And then you'll see uh, the classification appear. So let's zoom into that and take a look at what we've done. Okay, so as you remember, the dark green color is forest. The light green color is sort of the oak shrub areas. Um, the purple is burn scars. Um, and then blue is supposed to be lake. So you see a lot of, one thing is, there's a couple of things that we can see with this um, preview classification. One is that there are a lot of black pixels. And what black pixels means is that those pixels did not fit well into any of your um, signatures, any of, of your regions of interest, the statistics. So they fall outside sort of the minimum and maximum values of your statistics. Okay, so what that means is that you need to collect more training sites generally, or you can adjust the statistics of your um, existing signatures, and we'll be doing that next week. We won't do it this week, but that's what those black pixels mean. Okay, so um, if I turn on and off the preview, you can kind of see what we're getting and what we're not getting. Um, so we have a lot of other in there, which is kind of that light yellow area, and that's actually pretty good. We have a lot of forest. Um, which seems to be getting the dark vegetation. And we have the light vegetation, which is oftentimes oak trees, but you know, I'd have to go down there and do field work to find out. The burn area, if you look closely at the burn area, you'll see a lot of purple. So we got some of it, but you'll see a lot of black too. Um, so that means that you know, for future, like next week, we'll be collecting more training areas in those regions where there's black right now. Um, and you can see, it's funny, the lake areas didn't get classified as, at all either. So we got the one training site in the one large lake area. So in order to include these two lake areas, we'll have to do more training sites in those areas again next week. Okay, so the, you can see how useful this preview classification can be. It can give you an idea of how well you've done with getting your training sites and what you need to do more. So at this point, let's say we're happy with what we've done and we want to run the whole classification. So in order to do that, we'll go back to the left-hand side. I'm going to zoom back out to the whole image. I'm going to turn off the preview. You can also um, you can also trash the preview um, and put it in the trash can on the right hand side. It says remove temporary files, and that will get rid of your preview. That it goes away, and you can do a preview somewhere else if you want to. So now we're going to go to the SCP doc on the left hand side, and we're going to click um, run, which is the little icon on the lower right hand side. We'll click that, and we're going to give it a name. So I'm going to call this uh, Calaveras underscore six class, because there's six classes. You can call it whatever you want. And you save it, and then it starts running. So it takes a little while to run the classification, which is why it's really great to run previews first. And sometimes um, QGIS does some funny things. So this is, as this is running, I'm going to let it run because it might be hung up. Um, this is the end of the exercise that we're going to be doing for this week. So at this point, uh, you are more than welcome to go through the whole exercise yourself if you haven't done so already. Um, or uh, if you have questions right now, um, I'll be here to answer any questions that you might have. <laughs> it looks like my uh, 
my QGIS is a little hung up right now, but that's okay. Um, I've noticed that happens before. It'll eventually kick back in, and then you can see what the classification looks like. So, um, like I said, I'm willing to answer any questions. I'll be on here for a while. You can run through it yourself, um, especially if you haven't done this before. It's, you know, it takes a little while to sort of figure it all out. Um, and please feel free to ask any questions. I hope you are enjoying this format. Please give us feedback on how this works for you. Um, we'll be doing this again next week. Um, again, I'll be focusing on refining those spectral signatures. Um, and I wish you luck. Okay, I'm going to try to answer some questions here that I see. have been asked. So the, um, this software, just to give you guys a heads up, this software is new to me too. Um, and so I'm a little slow sometimes getting to this stuff, but I... Somebody asked why I was choosing maximum likelihood algorithm earlier. Um, as I said before, um, there's only three options for QG for this plugin. There's maximum likelihood, minimum likelihood, and spectral angle mapping. I would encourage you guys to try the different algorithms to see what works best for your area. Um, I chose maximum likelihood just because that is a very common algorithm to to choose. But, you know, go ahead and, and try other algorithms because each one, depending on your area, um, will produce slightly different results. So that's a, a, just a personal preference. So somebody seemed to have a problem retaining the band combination we are seeing with the Landsat stack. Um, so I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure what happened there, but in order to get the band combination, you have to make sure you go to the layers panel. And in the layers panel, oh, sorry, my um, classification is still running, so it's not letting me do anything right now. But it, you'll have to go back to the layers panel and right click um, on the preferences to to get the color combination that you want. Okay, so you should see my classification now. It finally, <laughs> it finally popped up. Um, and it shows up in your layers panel. So if you click back on the layers panel on the right hand side, you'll see at the very top um, Calavera 6 class, six class tiff showed up. Um, and then it has the legend underneath it. So you can see zero um, is uh, unclassified. So those are all the black areas that we'll try to take care of next week. Um, and then you see the six classes that we classified. Um, so generally, you know, did a pretty good job, but we can do a lot better and we'll do that next week. So then you can take this and you can put this into a GIS, another GIS, or, you know, do whatever you need to with it um, because it's now a TIFF file. Uh, so hopefully you guys can get to this point fairly easily. Okay, so let me go down. I'll, I'll take a look at the questions you've been asking. Uh, there's a great question here about clouds. So we're going to deal with clouds next week because um, there are a couple small clouds in this image, uh, and I didn't actually even notice them until I went through this uh, through this supervised classification exercise, and then I noticed the clouds. There's some small ones. So the only thing you can really do with clouds is uh, you can't eliminate them. So you're going to have to actually create, you can create a mask and you can 
uh, have them as a separate class. So your clouds will be, and the cloud shadows, you can't forget the cloud shadows as well because they cause a difference in spectral characteristics as well. Um, you have to create those as a different class. Uh, and then, you know, there are ways you can sort of eliminate them from the image, but you can't see under them. So we'll deal with some of that next week. Yeah, so somebody asked how you do an unsupervised classification with this plugin. I don't think there's a way you can do it. Um, I think this is really just for, because I looked around to try to find ways to do an unsupervised classification. Uh, and this plugin is really focused on using the supervised approach. The one thing you can do, however, again, is sort of a hybrid approach. And again, I'll show this, uh, I'll show you how to do this next week. But under classification algorithm, you can actually use the, um, you use the spectral signatures to classify most of your pixels. And then you can use an algorithm to classify the rest of the pixels. So that's kind of a, it's kind of a hybrid approach, but you can't, as far as I can tell anyway, unless somebody knows this better than I do, which is entirely possible, um, you can't do unsupervised with this plugin. Uh, somebody asked about how this can help with for red plus forest carbon reference emission levels. Um, so again, I'm not going to be answering questions outside what we're presenting here. Um, we did have, we, our set, did have a series on um, carbon management last year that I highly recommend that you watch because it discusses some of the image processing approaches you can take for um, estimating emission levels. Um, we're not gonna, we don't have time to do that here. This is simply um, an approach you can take to get land cover information. The one thing we aren't doing also in this class is we're not looking at change. So this is one static land cover map. We're not looking at change over time. That will be a future webinar that we definitely will do. We'll do a change detection webinar, which we've had a lot of demand for, but we wanted to start it off first with at least getting a basic land cover map. So somebody asked, what if we already have a shapefile that contains the training sites? Can we import it or should we manually recreate them? That's a really good question. Um, I'm not entirely sure if you can use, I'm looking at the input right now, if you can use an existing, um, if you can use existing shapefiles or something for training sites. If, yeah, I'm kind of looking, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm looking through things right now just because I don't know the plugin well enough to know if you can use existing ones. My guess is that you have to recreate them. I see, oh, there is an import signatures. I take that back. So there is a function in the, I have it up on the screen right now, where you can import an SCP file, but that's a previously made signature file, of course, using this plugin. There's a USGS library, um, an Astro library, or a CSV file. So if you had your training sites in a CSV file, it looks like you can import um, a shape file to use as signatures. So there you go. But not, it doesn't, or yeah, or you can import a shape file. Here we go. That's great. See, all your great questions are, now I'm learning stuff too. For those of you having problems with Globus, um, I know Elizabeth and Brock are doing a great job answering those questions, but again, the Globus website, they're, they're transitioning to a new form of Globus, so I would not recommend using Globus at this point. I would recommend using uh, Earth Explorer and we've provided a tutorial for you to download imagery through Earth Explorer um, on our website. Oh, somebody's asking about the RGB in the top. 
So this is the from the plugin tools across the top. You see this RGB. Honestly, I haven't had a lot of luck with that. Um, some of you may want to play around with that, which is why um, I chose to display my imagery in the layers panel and do it that way, and then put that image into the SCP doc. Um, because I was not super successful in selecting that RGB color composite using the radio button. That was just that was just me. I just found it a lot easier to do it the other way. So you may find it otherwise. You may be able to successfully use that RGB radio button at the top. Um, I just found it easier to use the layers panel. So there's a question, does QGIS help us for change detection after this classification? You can use QGIS. You wouldn't use the same plugin, um, obviously, but there are options for you to do change detection. And again, um, probably not this year. It'll probably be next year that we will do another advanced webinar focused on change detection, probably using QGIS as well. Oh, here's a good question. Does the SCP save the project in the event QGIS does crash and thus you wouldn't have to recreate the AOIs? Yes, so the best thing to do is to save the project. So I found that if you save the project at the top, um, you know, we created a new project at the very beginning and you continue to save it, um, it will save everything also. Um, in the training input, since you put uh, a file, you gave the, your signatures a file that ends in SCP, um, whatever you've done to that point, it will save those signatures to that file. So even if QGIS blows up um, at that point, you can bring in the input image and then you can bring in that training input again using that SCP file. So somebody asked um, how to change the view of the Landsat Calaveras. Um, so I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn off my class and go back to Okay, just to zoom in and out, if you go to the toolbar at the very top, there's all kinds of zoom and pan options. So right now I'm, I have my pointer on pan. There's, you can pan to selection. Um, you can zoom in. Uh, so this is how I use this plus to zoom in to specific areas. So right now I'll click on that and then I click a box in an area and then I can zoom in. And then to zoom back out to the whole image, I go to the icon at the top that says zoom full. So it's a little magnifying glass with all the arrows on it. And if I click on that, then I go back to the whole image. So I, I really encourage you to sort of understand how QGIS works first. It'll help you a lot in kind of maneuver, maneuvering around your image. Play around with that a little bit. Hmm, somebody said they saw a PCA option, which is unsupervised. Hmm, I don't remember seeing a PCA option, but well, at least in the algorithms, unless it's somewhere else. I'm not seeing a way to do unsupervised, but maybe I'll look into that a little bit for you and then have a better answer next week. Is there another method which makes band set stack spans? Yeah, so there there are other methods in QGIS where you can put bands together. Um, 
this was it's nice because it just kind of does it all for you. Um, and if I remember right, I believe if you go under raster, and I'm going on it right now, miscellaneous merge, that actually will also put bands together. So if you didn't want to have bands two through seven, which is what this plugin does, it only does bands two through seven. If you wanted to do a subset of that or include more bands or whatever, um, you could bring the bands together using this merge function. Oh, PCA is under the pre-processing tab. I'm learning a lot from you guys. Okay, let me see. Pre-processing. Oh, look at that. Huh. Oh, it's a principal components analysis. Okay. Okay, I can look into that a little bit more too. It's not a it's not really a um a classification algorithm. It it uses principal components analysis. So somebody had said it looks like they were displaying the imagery in 543 in layer properties, but it's it looks like it's giving a false color which is vegetation is, is red. So it sounds like you may have a different combination of bands then, because if that's the case, um, it, it shouldn't be. If you have 543 and you're using a Landsat 8 image, um, if you use the exact same image that we are using, um, this is Landsat 8, if it's Landsat 5 or 7, then it's gonna be different. But Landsat 8, you should have an, an image where the vegetation is green, not red. So you might want to double check what image you're using. And then also when you did the stack of bands, make sure it was 2 through 7. So the question is, QGS gives a similarly a similar quality result comparing with N NV. Um, and thank you, um, Brock and Elizabeth, for answering that question. Um, so we're, when you assess the results of your classification, that's a whole nother different thing that we're not um, going to approach with this course, which is accuracy assessment. So theoretically, if you're if it's using the same algorithm, so say you're using maximum likelihood in NV and you're using maximum likelihood in QGIS, then you should have pretty similar results. Um, you can use different algorithms in NV. Then there's more options in NV than there are in this plugin. So then you probably would get different results. Um, and it also depends on how you define your, your spectral signatures, your ROIs. But when you start getting down to looking at assessment of you know, quality or accuracy or anything like that, then we have to start discussing accuracy assessment approaches. And we're not going to do that. We don't have time to do that in this particular um, course, but we will definitely have a whole separate course focused on accuracy assessment. So there's a great question, should the training site selection be randomized? Um, it, so what a lot of people tend to do is for training sites is they will collect uh, training sites information. The, if you're setting aside some of your training site information to be used in accuracy assessment, which is what people do. So maybe you collect 50 training sites and oftentimes two thirds of that will be for your classification and one third you'll save for your accuracy assessment. 
in that case, you do want things to be randomized um, because your accuracy assessment, you know, needs to have some kind of randomness to it. If it's all in one area or something like that, then um, then you have to question your accuracy. For just doing um, training site selections, the 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 randomness isn't important. What's in, most important is collecting, trying to collect signatures that capture all the spectral variability um, in a particular land cover class. And to do that, what's important is to, to, to collect training sites that are scattered throughout the image. Okay, so it doesn't necessarily have to be random. The random part really comes with the accuracy assessment when you do that. Um, but in order to get capture spectral variability, it's good to get capture get training sites that are located throughout the whole image. So somebody asked a question, suppose we are working on classifying crops and get 100 signatures, what algorithm will we use? Again, the algorithm is really your own personal preference. Um, you might why, try a couple different algorithms. The thing about crops, um, and, and other vegetation is that you end up getting a lot of confusion between the crops because the spectral signature for crops between different crops, depending on the crop, is very, um, they're very, very similar. And so it's, it's probably better, for example, if you were using this plugin to use a um, spectral angle mapper or a maximum likelihood over the minimum distance because I think you'll be able to distinguish things a little bit better. However, I think you're still going to get a lot of confusion uh, no matter what algorithm you choose. And so when that happens um, for crops and for other um, types of vegetation types where you're getting a lot of confusion is you probably want to bring in some um, ancillary information to help you identify and then you can turn it into sort of a decision tree process. So for example, um, if you have crops um, that have certain characteristics, maybe they're located in certain areas, um, maybe you have some information about um, the environment around it, you want to add that information somehow to your um, decision tree process. It, for areas like mountain areas like this or where you have a lot of different sort of what we call bioregions, what a lot of people will do is they'll divide their area into bioregions. So for example, looking at our Calaveras County, we have the central, we have sort of the lower elevation area where you see all that pink. And then you have sort of a mid-range area where you have a lot of the oaks and the conifer, uh, oaks and the shrubs. And then you have the higher elevation areas that are mostly conifers. So if you wanted to get a more accurate classification, one thing you might do is divide this particular area up into maybe three different areas and you classify them all separately. And then you can bring them together at the end. And then there's other things you can bring in as well. You can bring in DEMs to look at maybe south facing slopes um, or different aspects because different vegetation types grow in different regions, things like that. Um, and a lot of people who do fairly accurate classifications bring in that other kinds of information to help identify what land cover classes are, especially vegetation when there's a lot of confusion. So somebody, okay, here's a couple questions about the pre-processing. So somebody asked, what's the difference in using uh, an atmosphere correction and not using it? Um, and DOS is that dark object um, approach. So if you're doing a single classification, a single image classification like this, um, lots of times doing an atmosphere correction um, doesn't matter a whole lot. Uh, it does, it may change the pixel values a bit to sort of correct for atmosphere. So it's always a good idea to do um, however, if you didn't have that approach available to you or you didn't know how to do it or something like that, 
Um, because classification is really looking at relative pixel values, it's really looking at the pixel values in that image and it's cl classifying those pixel values according to you know, the statistics in that image. You're not comparing it to anything else. Um, you can get away with not doing an atmospheric correction. Just remember the pixel values will be different. So when you're, say, to get collecting regions of interest, you want to make sure your the distance um, is appropriate for the pixel values that you have. Um, however, because that process, the pre-processing, is is was so is so easy to do in this plugin, um, it doesn't hurt uh, to do the atmosphere correction, and it's especially important when you're comparing one date of image to another date of image. So if you plan on doing change detection at some point, um, it's highly recommended that you do the atmosphere correction. And somebody asked about pan sharpening um, as a pre-processing step. My answer to doing pan sharpening before you classify is, is to not do it. So, and the reason is uh, because if you pan sharpen an image, you're changing the pixel values. So what pan sharpening does is it combines the higher resolution of a panchromatic image. So Landsat, um, no matter what, Landsat you're using has a, except for the earlier Landsats, has a higher resolution um, panchromatic band that you can use to sort of sharpen your image it, so you get the um, higher spatial resolution of the panchromatic band combined with the spectral resolution of the multispectral bands. The problem is when you do that, you change the pixel values of your image. And so that completely changes um, the the spectral values of um, the objects that you're trying to characterize. So I would recommend not doing pan sharpening. Pan sharpening is really just for visual purposes. So you're trying to make an image look better and clearer, um, but not for processing. So somebody asked, when I was doing band rendering, the band three showed up without minimum and maximum values. Um, it's hard for me to know what happened there. Um, does that mean when you did the, after you did the um, pre-processing, the atmospheric correction, that it didn't show up? Um, in the list, that's what I'm assuming that you meant. And you, one thing, you, when you do the pre-processing, you want to make sure, and this is really important, that only those Landsat bands are in that folder. You want to make sure only those Landsat bands are in that folder, nothing else, because when it goes to stack those bands into an image, it is looking at the order of things. Um, and so make sure there's nothing else in that folder. So somebody asked, which one of the following band combinations is best for land cover classification, 432 or 543? So in my opinion, the best combination, and I assume you mean for just for looking at the imagery, um, 432 or 543, is completely personal. So this is a band combination, the 543, where the vegetation is green, um, is my personal preference. And I like the 543 because it includes a, a mid-infrared band, so you can kind of see some moisture differences in soil and vegetation and that sort of thing. Um, but some people really like looking at things in false color, where your vegetation is red and you can see, distinguish, you know, you can distinguish vegetation types a little bit better with the red. Um, the human eye can actually distinguish red colors sometimes a little bit better than green colors. Um, so it is completely a personal preference. And you're only setting that up so you can go in and choose your training sites. So if you prefer looking at the image in false color where your vegetation is red instead of green, then you should display your imagery that way. So I, I just display it this way because that's what I personally prefer. Doesn't make any difference in the outcome. So somebody's getting confused between displaying imagery and what's used in the classification. 
Um, so the question is, why did we compose multiband with three bands, um, and or did we use the other bands in the classification? So just to make it clear, when we're displaying imagery, you can only dis display imagery in three bands, and that's just because it's that's the nature of the software. Um, you can you can you put things into red, green, and blue color bands um, to make color. So you can only do that with three bands. And so that's merely for displaying imagery. The, the bands that go into the classification part is completely different. And so the number of bands that you have in that stack that you made, and I'll go back to the layers panel. If I go back to the layers panel and I look at my B stack raster, right? That has more than three bands in it, as does my Landsat Calaveras, because I um, clipped Landsat Calaveras from the BStack raster file. So that has many more bands and just doesn't have three. So when you run your classification, it's on all of those bands. It's just it's not just on the three that you're displaying. So somebody asked about um, whether I'm going to show you how to stitch adjacent images. No, we're not going to do any kind of mosaicing or anything like that um, in this. It's simply showing you how to do a supervised classification. <laughs> oh, I see. Um, it looks like some people didn't get exactly the same image. Um, we originally, when we made this first exercise, we had a different Landsat image that we were using, and then we changed it. And so it looks like maybe the old exercise was originally put on the website. So now we should have the new exercise up for you. Um, and Elizabeth has provided a, a link to the new exercise that has the correct Landsat image. So if you're displaying a Landsat image and it doesn't have this big burn scar in it, you can still do the classification. Um, you just have to kind of take out the burn. <laughs> the burn part. Um, otherwise, I'd, I recommend going back and getting um, a different, the other Landsat image that we changed to. Apologize for that. So we still have a lot of you on. Um, that's great. Over 100 people, I guess. Um, so hopefully you're going through the exercise. Um, maybe you can let us know if you are, if you're kind of going through it and if you're running into any problems. It's 11.21, so we have a, a while that we can stay on. We're happy to do that. I'll probably go on mute for a little while, and as as uh, questions come up, I'll come back on and answer them uh, verbally. And then Elizabeth and Brock are kindly answering questions um, that have to do with our set or other kinds of organi organizational things. So we'll still be on for you if you have questions. And then at about a quarter to four East Coast time, I believe, quarter to one my time, I'll come back on and kind of close things, um, close things up. Hi, everyone. I'm just noticing some questions coming in, sorry. <laughs> um, I didn't see them coming in before because of the order of the questions. So I apologize for that. Um, I meant to come on and answer your questions. There's one question here. If I need to identify other attributes in the landscape like urban areas, is it necessary to change the band's order? So I assume that question means, do you need to change the order of the bands that you're, that you're viewing? Um, in order to see maybe urban better? Um, and uh, the answer, the short answer would be yes. You want to display the imagery that shows the information that you're most interested. I'm going to zoom into an urban area. It, there, there aren't a, bit, a lot of big urban areas in this particular image. Um, but there are a couple small ones, and I'm going to zoom into that because most band combinations will be able to um, show the urban areas. It's just how big those urban areas are and what you want to see in them. Um, and so I'm going to zoom in here. So hopefully you all can see this. It's right by a little bit north of the lake. 
It's very small, as you can see. They're very small cities in this area. Um, so this, I'm going to make sure you can see this. Yes, now you can see this. I'm going to put my pointer here. But see these little blue, kind of blue-purple areas? Those are actually urban. And next week, when we do more uh, with our training sites and um, kind of um, kind of work with our signatures a little bit, we'll be dealing with urban. Urban is difficult because it's very, very heterogeneous. It has very many different pixel values in it. So there isn't just like one urban signal necessarily. It gets mixed up with a lot of things. So <clears throat> urban is very challenging. Um, unless you can use something else to I, help identify it, like elevation or something like that. Um, and in this urban area, you can see this small urban area kind of in the middle here, this blue, bluish purpley area. If you go south from there, you will see this kind of green area. That's actually a golf course. And it's surrounded by other urban types of area, but part of that urban area has a lot of vegetation in it. So you can see that blue, purple, but you can also see the green in there. So you can see why urban itself would get very confused with other things, and it does. It's very challenging to classify. Um, and even if you look over to the lake on the right-hand side here, at the edge of the lake, um, where it's there's no water, but it's it's that same kind of purpley blue color. Um, you can get urban mixed up with that kind of stuff pretty easily. So urban is challenging. Um, this combination works pretty well to look at urban areas and other areas as well. But uh, again, the band combination is really dependent on, on your own preference. So I would try different band combinations to see what you prefer and to see what land cover type that you're mostly interested in. Hopefully that answers your question. So somebody's having some problems with the pre-processing part. Um, it doesn't recognize the MTL text file in your imagery folder. I just wanna, I'm gonna bring up my folder just to sh make sure that your folder looks like my folder. Let me do that. Actually. Okay, so the images in your folder, your Landsat images should look exactly like this for Landsat 8. If you have other Landsat files, I mean, if you're following this exercise, it should look exactly like this. So you can see the MTL file at the top, and then you can see all the other bands. There shouldn't be anything else in this file, in this folder. Um, and like I say, the, the terminology should look exactly like this. If it doesn't, it's not going to recognize. I've, I went through this as well, but I had um, I had a lot of other stuff in my folder for whatever reason, and I had a problem with the pre-processing part. The other thing is, if for some reason it's not recognizing the MTL file, which it should, but if it's not, you can also specify where that MTL file is in that second line in the pre-processing part. So you can see how that works. Oh, somebody uh, said that their pre-processing is taking a long time. <laughs> it really depends on your system. And sometimes I notice um, on my PC, when I run some processes on QGIS, that QGIS will actually become non-responsive for a while. So you notice that when I actually ran my classification that it kind of hung for a little bit, but then it came back. Um, so this person was saying that their pre-processing is taking about 30 minutes. It, it, it could possibly take that long. It does take a long time to run it. It probably didn't take that long for my computer, but 
it really just depends on your computer and what else is going on there. So I'd I'd hang in there a little bit more um, to see if it if the process ends. Um, the one thing QGIS doesn't always do so well is show you sort of a status bar. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, it's kind of hard to know where you are in the process, but um, hang in there a little bit longer um, and see if it finishes up. So a lot of you are asking whether you need to um, stay here for the whole session. You definitely don't. If you're done with running an exercise or you know you need to go on to other things in your life, uh, please feel free to sign off. We're just staying on here in case you have questions. If you are running through the exercise, if you're running into problems, um, if you have questions, then I'll stay on here until um, for another hour or so. But if you're finished, um, or if you just need to go, that's fine. You don't you don't have to stay on here. And then we'll come back next week for part two. Okay, have you resampled the Landsat image? Oh, so somebody asked, how, did I resample the Landsat image you are rendering as it seems sharper than mine? Uh, no, I actually did not resample it. Um, I didn't do anything with it. It's directly as it was downloaded from um, Globus. So I'm not sure. It could be maybe screen resolution that make a difference. Not entirely sure, but it should be exactly the same as what you're seeing. Okay, so I see your folder name. So somebody who is still having problems with the pre-processing part. Oh, I see. And also, right, I, I think some of you may be using a different image. Um, and that was just, that's our mistake because I think we put on the older version of the exercise. It's okay, you can still go through this process. You're just not going to see the burned area. So Sylvia, you the folder name um, actually looks good. I'm gonna go back to my folder if I can find it. Yeah, your folder name is a little bit different because um, where it says two four nine, mine is actually two six five two six two four nine. If you use two four nine, you will not see the burn area. Um, if you use 265, you will see the burn area. So that's the difference um, between the two. So if your folder has all of those files, it that pre-processing should work. So I'm not entirely sure why it's not working for you. Uh, somebody had a problem with the band, stacking bands, Python crashes and won't complete the process. Uh, I'm sorry. I shut down QGIS and will attempt again. Yeah, I shut down QGIS, tried again. The stacking bands part is pretty straightforward. Um, so I'm not entirely sure why it's crashing on you. I know QGIS I know can be a little stable sometimes, so there's not much I can do about that, unfortunately. You can also try stacking the bands the other way, using the other approach if if that one approach doesn't seem to be working. If using the, the plugin keeps causing a crash mark, then I would try going doing raster miscellaneous merge. And if you do that, you can stack files, you can stack images that way. You just have to choose the bands that you want to stack. Yeah, a lot of people are saying pre-processing takes a long time. It does take a long time. That's why I didn't do it in the demo. <laughs> Um, so somebody asked, what if I clip the image first and then launch pre-processing? Um, you can probably do that actually, um, because then it wouldn't take so long. The, I, the only thing is I hesitate doing that because you might 
need that rest of that image at some point. Um, and it would be nice to have that all already pre-processed, but you can give that a try. Go ahead and clip. The, uh, the only thing is, is then you'd have to clip the individual bands and they'd have to have the exact same file names. You know what I mean? Because the software is looking for very specific file names when it does the stacking. When it does the pre-processing, sorry. When it does the pre-processing, it's looking for very specific file names. So um, you'd have to be very careful about what you rename those files, I think. It would be faster though. Please ask the person for a long folder path or spaces on folder path, name path. Not sure what you're asking there, Paul, but Paolo, sorry, not Paul, Paolo. Um, every computer is different. I, I never put spaces in folder path names. It's just a habit of mine. I always use underscore or something like that. So I don't have any problems. Um, with the path names at all. I don't know if any of you have out there have tried using um, path names with spaces in them. Um, I just I just find it in general to be a good habit not to put spaces in path names for things like this. Oh, I see. So Paolo's saying Python may fail with spaces and long paths. Got it. So that may be part of the problem with Python um, not working for various processes is if you have spaces in your path name, um, Python may not deal with that very well. Got it. Thank you. Spaces, no way. Perfect. I agree with you. Avoid spaces. Yeah, Paolo also made a really good point that um, that you should keep the plugin updated as well as the version of QGIS updated. Mine actually isn't. I'm not even following my own advice, but um, but especially to keep things stable, um, to keep things from crashing, especially with Python and so forth, um, it is really important to keep all everything updated to the current version. Thank you, Paolo. So um, for those of you still on, Paolo just made a request that we could all run the same set of signatures provided by our team. Um, and there's, I think there's pros and cons to doing that. I think the pro would be then we could all have a similar output and you all don't know this area very well um, for sure but the con is that I really want you to experience what it's like developing these training sets on your own so in a way it doesn't really matter what the output is really um, because you don't have anything to compare it to anyways I mean the the whole point of this is for you to get a feel for how these training sites work. And so when you do it yourself, I think you get a better feel for how the training sites work and you know what the statistics will look like. And they may differ from mine. They won't differ that much because I think you get the general idea of it. Um, but we're not gonna be doing any kind of accuracy assessment. Um, and so I just felt like it'd probably be easier. It would add another level of complication, I think, to try to send you all training site um, you know, like shape files or something like that. So anyway, it's a great suggestion, Paolo. Um, but I, just to keep things simple, I think we'll just keep it this way.
Okay, so Tim is having a problem with clipping. It works, but when I set bands to 543, the output is mostly yellow rather than the same as the B-Stack raster. That's interesting. Okay, so let's take a look at your at your clipped image. If you, I'm going to display some properties of my clipped image. So I'm going to go to Layers Panel um, and go to Landsat Color Varus and right click on it and go to Properties. First of all, just to start off with, Tim, is that um, what I'd like you to do if you go to properties is take a look at the band values for each of the different bands. So if you go to the red band and you have band five, you can see my values are 0 0.04, min, 0.39 max. Band 4, 0 0.07, and 0.29, and band 3, 0 0.02, 0 0.15. First to see if there's similarities between those. And it almost sounds like maybe two of your bands are, are the same. Um, is what So if two of those numbers are equal, then two of your bands are the same. And you may have to repeat um, the clip. Actually, what you may need to do is take a look at your... B stack to make sure all those bands look normal too. And then what we can do is go under information and properties. And if we go down to, if we go down and it'll say band one, band two, and so forth, and give all the statistics, band three, band four, band five, band six, um, what I would do is make, check those values to, to make sure none are the, this, that they're all different from each other. Like I say, to, to make sure you aren't repeating bands. Um, that, that's what I would do at this point. See if there's any differences there. Because it sounds like maybe two of your bands may be, for some, for some bizarre reason, um, may end up being the same. So let me know what you find when you go through that process. Somebody, Wilfredo said, Google Earth might help with selecting training sites for sure. Um, Google Earth is great to help with selecting training sites. Um, that's what I was saying earlier in the lecture is that you can use high resolution um, aerial photos or you can use high resolution satellite imagery such as Google Earth to help you both select training sites um, and then also do accuracy assessment as well. I, I, I absolutely agree with that. Oh, somebody says he needs to load min max values. Oh, maybe that's what he didn't do. So Charles said, I think Tim, maybe when you, um, I'm gonna go back to my properties here and go back to style. You have to make sure that you click load on the right-hand side, that the contrast enhancement is, is set to stretch to min-max, and then click load. That may be part of the problem too. Bingo, excellent. Thank you everyone who, who figured that out. Yeah, so Daniel said that he used spectral angle mapping that gave him a better result than max likelihood. It's entirely possible. Um, you can try both different ways to see what works better for you. And next week, maybe when we do, when we look at spectral signature, signatures and we run the classification, maybe we can do it both ways to compare the two. 
And he's also running a newer version, QG. I know, I just haven't loaded the new version on yet, so. Everybody got the load thing <laughs> in RTB for Tim. Glad we figured that out for you, Tim. Well, Tim, I'm impressed that you're hanging in there and it's after 4 a.m. there. I don't know where you are, but thank it. We appreciate your dedication. <laughs> hey, everyone, if you're done, if you are done with the exercise, you can certainly log out anytime. So thanks for everyone for hanging in there and running through the exercise. Um, and we'll we'll see you next week. I'll I'll um, I'll stay logged on for another half an hour or so for those of you finishing things up. Hey, Mark, good luck with the Python thing. I hope um, shortening the file path name works. If any of you have um, any expertise in Python, maybe you can give Mark some ideas on how to deal with that. But let us know. Um, We'll catch up next week and see how it's going. Hi, everyone. This is uh, Cindy. I'm back. Um, and I'm just kind of checking in to see if uh, anyone is still working on the exercise. If you could let me know in the questions section, that would be great. If you're all done, uh, that's great too. You're welcome to leave the session. Um, if you are still working, what I'll do is stay on for another 15, 10 or 15 minutes or so till one o'clock my time. Um, if no one is on anymore, I still see a few people online. So uh, if, if you aren't working on the exercise, Okay, some people are still working, so that's great. No worries. I will stay on until for another 10 minutes or so. And uh, hopefully, if you have any questions, you're still feel free to, to ask them. You can always email me as well during the week if you need to <clears throat> finish it later on. And uh, so I'll wait for another 10 minutes or so, and then I'll close things off. Thanks, everyone. All right, everybody, it's about that time. So hopefully you've all had a chance to run through the exercise. If not, you know, if you have questions during the week, if you try to do it, please don't hesitate to contact me. My email is listed right here, cynthia.l.schmidt at nasa.gov. Um, if you have general RSET questions, you can contact Anna Prados or you can go to our website listed there. And I just want to thank everybody for attending this week and hanging in there for four full hours. Um, it's a really different format for us. So we'd appreciate any feedback that you have about um, how this format went for you. And we look forward to seeing you at our class, our course next week, where we will work on improving the supervised classification. So thanks, everyone, and talk to you next week.